All right. We are thrilled that you are all here. Welcome, everybody. Hello. I look forward to an insightful and inspiring evening. Whether you're a law student or a member of the community, you've seen the headlines. Sex trafficking makes the news and infl infiltrates our social media feeds, whether we like it or not. But these eye-catching and salacious stories are doing a disservice to the real and pervasive issue of human trafficking. Tonight, however, you'll hear from our panel of experts who are all members of the Suffolk County Anti-Trafficking Initiative, which will from now on be referred to as SCADI, just so you guys know because it's a mouthful, task force. They'll share about their dedication to combating human trafficking in Suffolk County and what that hard work entails. You're gonna hear firsthand about their stories, their professional experiences, doing the work every day to prevent, identify, and protect victims of sex trafficking here in Suffolk County. Our final speaker tonight is a survivor of human trafficking. And she's here tonight to share with all of you the truth behind her experiences of being trafficked and her journey to rebuild her life. Thank you to all of you for taking the time to learn and grow in your awareness about human trafficking. Together, we can combat human trafficking in our community, Suffolk County. I'll introduce each panelist before they present, but first I'd like to introduce myself and define human trafficking briefly and explain what the SCADI is. This is one of my fanciest slides. <laughs> okay, I'm Molly England. Hello, by the end of the night, you'll be sick of hearing from me. I earned my master's degree of social work from the University of Edinburgh, Scotland. And I have a bachelor's degree in psychology from the University of California, Santa Barbara. I'm certified in trauma-informed care through the University, University of Buffalo School of Social Work. My career started as a social work and program director at Homeless Healthcare Los Angeles. I provided an array of services, case management, counseling, all with the aim of empowering and supporting individuals who are experiencing homelessness. My current position as the Suffolk County Anti-Trafficking Initiative SCADI Task Force Coordinator is an exciting opportunity to further my commitment to holistic individual and community-wide development. I'm the point of contact as the coordinator for the task force and I develop agendas and protocols, I coordinate meetings, I work with our researchers for overseeing the data collection and reporting. I'm responsible for developing and updating all of our documents and everything that we put out into the world. The public awareness materials are important to us. And tonight you should have received some handouts from our presenters and also the SCADI. And also I did a little plug for our social media earlier with those questions that were rotating in the slide. So please feel free to visit our Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. I liaise with the task force members and provide guidance and management to meet our goals and objectives. Really briefly, because throughout tonight, you guys are going to be experts in human trafficking, specifically sex trafficking. But just to quickly identify what it is, um, basically human trafficking is forced sex work and or forced labor for commercial gain. It's often referred to, I'm sure you've heard, as modern slavery. According to the federal legislation, the Traffic Victim Victims Protection Act, TVPA 2000, defines human trafficking as sex trafficking in which a commercial sex act is induced by force, fraud, or coercion, or in which the person induced to perform such act has not attained 18 years of age, meaning force, fraud, or coercion do not need to be present if it's a child. The recruitment, harboring, transportation, provision, or obtaining of a person for labor or services through the use of force, fraud, or coercion for the purpose of subjugation to involuntary servitude, peonage, debt bondage or slavery. Oh, sorry. Our mission is to support the prosecution. Oh, no, excuse me. Okay. Like I mentioned, we're gonna be concentrating on sex trafficking tonight. 
You'll probably hear the terms interchangeably, human trafficking, sex trafficking, but just please be reminded that we're specifically talking tonight about sex trafficking. The SCADI Task Force. It was created around the end of 2018 and really got going in 2019 by Suffolk County Police Department and Empowerment Collaborative of Long Island to combat human trafficking in Suffolk County. The SCADI Task Force is federally funded through a grant called the Enhanced Collaborative Model Task Force to Combat Human Trafficking. The SCADI is a group of multidisciplinary professionals and stakeholders, including the Suffolk County Sheriff's Office, the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office, the Suffolk County Department of Probation, the U.S. Attorney's Office, Homeland Security, FBI, local not-for-profit organizations, drug rehab programs, legal services, educators, faith-based groups, and social services. Here's some of their logos. This is not everybody. This is just the prettiest logos. Tonight, you'll hear from many of the SCADI's core members. Our mission is to support the prosecution of traffickers, identify and support victims holistically, and educate the community and create awareness of issues of human trafficking. As you can see in this slide, it was very intentional to put the survivor at the center of all of these agencies, because throughout tonight, you'll understand that every policy, every action, every move that the that the individuals make, the professionals, is with the survivor at the center. What are the SCADI's goals and objectives? Well, we identify victims of all forms of human trafficking, and this is done through coordinated training, public awareness and outreach, like tonight, and trauma-informed screen screening and interview techniques. We conduct proactive investigations of sex and labor trafficking with the goal of successful prosecution at the local, state, and federal levels. We ensure a comprehensive array of support services are available to meet the individualized needs of all victims. And collaboration is key. We could not do this without working together. Our shared responsibilities help protect the most vulnerable segment of our population and combat human trafficking. By developing and enhancing a process for sharing and analyzing our data, law enforcement and victim services are able to inform the work that they do. SCADI is able to evaluate the scope of the trafficking issue in Suffolk County using statistically reliable methods, as well as identifying trends or gaps in victims identification, services, investigations, and prosecutions. SCADI strives to raise public awareness of human trafficking through community outreach and education, as well as education within the task force. We meet regularly and do in-service trainings too. The task force is guided by a trauma-informed and victim-centered approach. This means that the victims of human trafficking are prioritized, their needs are met, their interests are at the heart of every move we make, at the center of the work that we do. Here are some of the key areas of trauma-informed and victim-centered approaches. We provide non-judgmental assistance with an emphasis on empowering the victim. We support victims in making informed choices for themselves. I should mention here also that the, the term victim and survivor um, are used interchangeably. It's really a victim of a crime and a survivor, but I'm going to, for the purposes of tonight, use them somewhat interchangeably. Prioritize victims' feelings of safety. Revise policies and practices that may inadvertently re-traumatize victims. Ensure the victims' voice and rights are included throughout the development and implementation of any task force activities. And of course, have an awareness of cultural, historical, and gender issues. Here's a few answers to the quiz, which was a challenge, I hope, and some of the sources and photo credit. Now, I have to switch screens. Okay. We have our first presenter now. Well, second, including myself. Detective Sergeant James P. Murphy. Detec 
Detective Sergeant James P. Murphy is a 31-year veteran with 10 years spent in investigative commands as a detective and the last 15 years as a detective supervisor. Sergeant Murphy's commands include the Narcotics Bureau, First Squad, Fourth Squad, Criminal Intelligence, and the District Attorney's Office. In March 2018, he, along with Detective Lieutenant Masana, created the new Human Trafficking Investigation Unit. Over to you, Sergeant Murphy. Thank you very much. And thank you for giving me the opportunity to speak today. My name is James Murphy and I'm a detective sergeant, which means I supervise a team of detectives. I'm in my 32nd year and I do run the Human Trafficking Investigations Unit here in Suffolk County. We're dedicated solely to investigating sex trafficking and labor traffic. This is all we do. We're responsible for Suffolk County from the Nassau border uh, to the Montauk Lighthouse. We created the unit in March of 2018 and we currently have six handpicked investigators. I'll stop by saying what we are seeing is nothing like the movie Pretty Woman and nothing close to the movie Taken. The people who are trapped in this prostitution lifestyle are not doing this uh, because they want to or choose to. We're not seeing white vans pulling up to young girls and snatching them off the street. Our victims are from our local communities, Smithtown, Huntington, Copeg, uh, West Babylon, Sayville, and Mastic are just some examples of hometowns our victims come from. There's no community that is immune. We've interviewed over 220 victims living in this lifestyle here in Suffolk County. Most of the victims we interview are between the ages of 16 and 24. A large majority have indicated that they started in life at about the age of 13. If you work in a local school district, you've probably seen some of our victims walking your hallways. If you have children who attended our schools, our victims were their classmates. Think about what I just said. How many of you were able to recognize or try to help a victim in trouble? We need our communities to become aware of the situation we're dealing with. Now, maybe if one person were able to recognize and reach out a helping hand, I would never have met this person because they'd be on a better path. Statistics show 99% of victims in this lifestyle do not do this as a choice. They're being forced, manipulated, or coerced. Now, most of the girls we've interviewed told us they endured a rape or a sexual abuse before they turned 13 years old. These abuses occurred in their own household, usually at the hands of a father figure, dad, stepdad, a brother, or an uncle. When a woman is raped once, she has to deal with and live with that trauma and violence for her entire life. Now I want you to imagine a 13 year old trying to deal with multiple rapes and abuses in their short lifetime. Uh, they have no support at home. Their view of love is skewed. This is exactly what the traffickers are looking for. They're looking for someone who, for the lack of a better word, is broken, depressed. We have to change the perception of who these victims are. We have to understand the trauma that they have endured throughout their lives. And if we do this, it'll make it easier to recognize and identify them so we as a community can lend a helping hand. And most of the prostitution we see is initiated on the internet. There are sex ad sites that the victims are advertised on. A contact is made, negotiations are completed. The meat and sex act normally occur in a hotel or motel. As no community is immune from being a victim's hometown, no hotel or motel is immune from the sex trafficking trade. We have pretty much been in every hotel and motel in Suffolk County, the small roadside motels, 
and the large hotel chains. Now, our main goal in this unit when, when we created it was to be a part of the support system these victims desperately needed. We wanted all of our investigations to revolve around the victim, a complete victim-centered approach. We felt, and we still do, if we can safely remove the victims from the lifestyle and help them on a more uh, healthy and productive path, that greatly limits the amount of sex trafficking that can occur. Now let's add in the community, recognizing our vulnerable population and helping them before they can be manipulated, the numbers go down even further. Now I said our main goal was to be a part of the support system these victims need. We knew from the very beginning, we couldn't do this ourselves. We also knew we can't arrest our way out of the situation. Our team needed to make partnerships with other law enforcement agencies, advocacy groups, and community groups. The biggest connection we made is this task force we belong to, SCADI, the Suffolk County Anti-Trafficking Initiative. This task force brings together so many entities to work together in helping these victims. We have an advocacy agency, ECLI, you'll hear from them tonight. We couldn't be nearly as successful without the advocates at ECLI. These advocates are available to us 24 seven and can respond wherever we are. The work they do is truly amazing. They have the needed patience, caring and understanding. I'm in awe of what they accomplish. We've also partnered with community groups like the Sayville Congregational Church and Access Church in Medford We've given presentations uh, at both churches, uh, trying to bring awareness of the situation to the communities. These churches have truly stepped up and have both lent an incredible amount of support to our victims. We've built a successful model to attack the human trafficking problem that exists here, actually all over the country. This model can be copied throughout the entire United States. When we started, Suffolk County had only two convictions for sex trafficking. In the prior 18 months, there were no sex trafficking investigations. We have now arrested 53 traffickers. One of our cases dealt with a 12 year old being actively recruited into prostitution in a Ronkonkoma motel room. Now, luckily, the police department was able to locate and save her. And I'll go back. I said 12 years old. Another case was initiated in Holtzville when my team rescued three women in the back of a van. They were on the way to a hotel. They were crying and upset because they hadn't eaten in three days. They were being punished for something one of them did. Now, to me, that sounds like torture. Right in Holtzville. These are just two examples of what, hap what is happening here uh, in our community. Our last two convictions led to a nine and a half year jail term for a trafficker from the Rocky Point area and a 25 year sentence for a trafficker from the Deer Park area. The Rocky Point trafficker was using his basement in his parents' house to sell these women for sex. Unfortunately, he has six victims associated with him that died of heroin overdoses. The drugs are used to keep the victims high, so they continue selling themselves to make money for the trafficker without complaining. I can tell you these deaths are devastating to the families. I've personally sat and spoke with some of their moms, and the pain continues to stay with me each day. This position is the most heartbreaking I have ever been involved in, but at times is the most rewarding. When I have a survivor tell me they finally feel powerful, or when a survivor is so proud when they reach a sober milestone, um, when a survivor talks about goals and dreams, and, and a short time ago didn't even know how to dream for themselves, or when one of our survivors thanks us, the smile and thank you helps wipe away all the hurt and difficulties we see every single 
day. Now, some of our presenters tonight will speak about trauma and trauma bonding, which will answer why these victims are so vulnerable to the traffickers and why they tend to stay in such dangerous situations. Uh, others will speak about red flags to look for. I'm asking you to please listen carefully because we need the help from the community to help those that are in this lifestyle and identify those that are vulnerable to being recruited. If you do see something or suspect something, if it's an emergency, call 911. If it's something we can follow up on, the easiest way to report it is through Crime Stoppers, a 1-800-220-TIPS. You can remain completely anonymous or leave your contact info. If it's related to human trafficking, that tip is forwarded to me by email within minutes. I'm really hopeful that through this symposium and other community presentations that SCADI can continue making valuable partnerships throughout our community in order to combat human trafficking. Thank you so much, Sergeant Murphy. That was incredible. I just wanna remind everybody that throughout the course of the presentations, please feel free to put a question in the Q&A uh, component on the Zoom. And now we have our next presenter. We're gonna be hearing from Feride Castillo. Ms. Castillo is the co-founder and director of advocacy at the Empowerment Collaborative of Long Island. For the past seven years, Ms. Castillo has provided trauma-informed advocacy, case management, re-entry, and other support services to victims of human trafficking, at-risk, incarcerated, and court-involved women and youth. Ms. Castillo also assisted in forming and currently sits as a member of the federally funded SCADI. SCADI is a close collaboration of both non-governmental agencies and governmental agencies victim service providers, educators, researchers, and other community stakeholders tasked with developing and implementing a coordinated community response to all forms of trafficking in Suffolk County, in addition to outreach and education. I give you Betty Castillo. Hi, everyone. Are you gonna put up the PowerPoint? Yes. I think you might need to get a little closer to the mic too. Okay, can you hear me now? Yeah, better, okay. All right, so my name is Fetty, uh, Fetty Castillo. I am the director, I'm the co-founder and director of advocacy for ECLI. Um, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about what it's like working with the survivors. Um, Sarge did a great job of kind of giving an introduction of how we initially meet many of our uh, victims and survivors. Uh, we do work uh, a lot with, um, primarily with the Suffolk County PD Human Trafficking Unit, um, but, there, but we also um, you know, work a lot with the jail system and you will hear from uh, Sergeant Munkle in, in, a, in a few minutes and how we work in the jails um, and also with probation. And you're gonna hear from, uh, Officer um, Jill, oh, Jill Porter um, in a little while too to talk about how we work with probation. Um, we are very grassroots and we, um, it's so important for us to really keep the connection with the individuals in the community. Um, everything that we do is victim centered. Everything that we do is to support the survivor in their whole, own healing process and Healing for us is at the forefront of everything that we do because we know that in order for um, survivors to really be rehabilitative or to find their, to get their power back, like Sarge said, you know, it's a long process. Um, one of the things that I, that I, I really do um, appreciate that Sarge is always saying is that these girls come from a long history of trauma that kind of shapes the who they become and the the path that they uh, end up on and so we're gonna I'm gonna talk more about the psychological impact of it because I think that's really important people don't understand you know what happens to an individual to to, to the point where they end up in a situation like this and people are always asking me why don't they just leave why would they allow that 
so on and so on. And so I think it's really, it's really, really important to understand the psychology behind all of it. So we're gonna talk a little bit about that. Molly, you wanna to go to the next slide? So when ECLI was created, it was really created with the idea that we weren't going to focus on certain aspects of someone's life. We were going to look at them in, at their entirety. Everything that they've ever been through, everything that they carry to, uh, with them to get them to the point where they're now in front of me or, or someone from ECLI. What has happened to them, right? What has occurred over a lifetime? What, is a, what has shaped them throughout their life? And trauma is really the, one of the things that I can truly say is a common denominator among all victims and survivors, all of them. There is not one survivor or victim that I've ever met that has not had a long history of trauma. It just doesn't happen that way. And so, and so when we look at this victimization that, that permeates past socioeconomic status, gender, uh, uh, race, none of those factors um, discriminate. What we're seeing is that individuals with severe forms of trauma throughout their life are the individuals who these perpetrators or traffickers are finding vulnerabilities in um, in order to groom, in order to manipulate, in order to co coerce or force. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about that. But these are some of the issues that many of our um, survivors are coming to us with. These are all the things, right? Sexual abuse, domestic violence, rape, harassment, um, you know, toxic gender roles, racism, discrimination, oppression, incarceration, mental health, neglect, so far and so far, right? So far um, and so forth. Okay, so what happens when someone has a lot of trauma experiences throughout their life? is that, I don't know if anyone's ever heard of the Maslow's hierarchy of need, but Maslow is one of my favorites. And he, his theory was that if individuals received all and met all of their basic needs, such as you know, stability of housing, food, water, safety, that they were able to, their brain was able to develop um, in a healthy, proper way. But what happens when those things don't exist for someone? What happens when you know, the abuse is constant, when there's domestic violence in their home? What happens is that there's this thing called fight or flight, right? Where the brain then secretes all these hormones into the body. And what happens when you have a fight or flight is that your heart starts to you know, go, starts to race, your hands get clammy, right? And all of a sudden, it is your most basic primitive part of the brain that's reacting to whatever circumstances are around it. There's no higher form of understanding or learning or developing in that moment. And so what individuals, what, with individuals with severe trauma, when they go through severe forms of trauma throughout an entire life, that reaction never gets shut off. And so they're developing in that. That means that there is never a moment where they feel safe enough where their brain develops properly or in a healthy way. And so what we call that is survival brain. These are individuals who are just trying to survive their everyday life. And when these kids end up to become adult, becoming adults, they continue and perpetuate these same cycles of um, toxic habits and maladaptive behaviors that will lead them into toxic relationships, incarceration, et cetera. Molly, next slide. So the victims, statistically speaking, are individuals from low socioeconomic status and limited resources for the same things that we talked about. When you don't have stability, when you don't have uh, resources disposable to you, when, you are, when you're constantly feeling unsafe, we as human beings are constantly seeking it. 
The problem is, is that when there's violence and abuse in our backgrounds, especially from a young age, is that we normalize that behavior. So we don't realize that we're continually and perpetually falling into those cycles over and over and over again. Individuals who have hit the foster care group home, it is so important that we understand many of our victims that we have worked with have a history of group home involvement. In fact, it wasn't until they were removed from the home and placed in a group home where they became susceptible to a trafficker. I need people to really understand that. It is when we break down the family unit. It is when we uh, separate people and create more instability where these perpetrators, these traffickers are putting their hooks into our girls to the, until they disappear. And then we catch them later on in life. Substance abuse, like Sarge said, if they're not, if these traffickers are not starting them off with drugs, they might already be addicted. And these traffickers, many of these traffickers are also selling drugs and weapons. Many a times they are also gang members. And so um, if they get you started on drugs and they're supplying it, where are you going? You will always be dependent upon them. We've also have had survivors and victims with developmental intellectual disabilities. Um, many, many of our young people who have never even finished high school, were, stopped going to high school in the ninth, 10th, 11th grade. You know, we, uh, our school districts, like Sarge said, we have to do a better job. Where are these girls ending up? Where are these youth ending up? What are, what's happening to them? The juvenile justice system, right? Again, because these are the young people that we're pushing out, that we're throwing away that we're not really paying attention to. And guess who's paying attention? These traffickers. The LGBTQ and refugees and immigrants, but the reality is that it can be anyone. Because one of these things, the tactics that these um, traffickers do is that they use love and relationships to fill the voids of our young people and, uh, and groom them into the life. Molly, you wanna go next? So when people ask me, what is the biggest thing that you see as a common denominator for trafficking? One, trauma. And the reason why trauma is so important is because it creates vulnerabilities in people, okay? If you were neglected as a child, guess what? If you didn't feel loved as a child, guess what? These perpetrators, these traffickers are gonna be first in line to make them feel like they're in a relationship and they're loved and that, and that they have someone and they're buying them clothes and then getting them jewelry and grooming them into the life. So this is how traffickers will get their hooks on many of our young people through their vulnerability to gain access and then ultimately control. Um, Molly, next. So when people ask me, why don't they just leave? if it's so volatile and hostile. Well, there's a thing called trauma bond and trauma bonding occurs when there's a power imbalance. When there's uh, very high uh, moments of like love and, and passion, um, but then also really low moments of abuse. The, the victim actually creates an addictive attachment similar to a drug. So when people tell, when I tell, when people to ask me, why don't they leave? I go, because victims become uh, attached and addicted to their trafficker. And so it's extremely difficult for them to leave. Remember that these are the individuals who are providing them a home, who are providing them clothes, food, even if it comes with a price. So unless we're willing to do the same for them, without expecting anything in return, we can't, we can't expect them to just walk away. These are individuals who are depending on these, folks, on, on these perpetrators for everything that they have in order to survive. They're not just gonna walk away from that. Okay, uh, Molly, next. So I'm gonna leave you with this because I think this is probably one of the most powerful tools that ECLI uses, relationships. We gain the trust build the rapport, and honestly, as corny as it sounds, but we love our clients until they understand that people can love them without wanting anything from them. That is so important. You give them purpose, you give them empowerment, and you give them 
a sense of hope when you connect with another human being and help them to understand that there are people out here that want nothing from you except to see you succeed in life. And I leave you with that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Betty. All right. Our next speaker is Deputy Bureau Chief Leslie Anderson. Deputy Bureau Chief Leslie B. Anderson is a graduate of SUNY Albany and has a Bachelor of Arts degree in political science and history. During her junior year of college, she studied abroad at the University of Edinburgh in Edinburgh, Scotland. She graduated from Union University Albany Law School with a Juris Doctor Law degree in 1990. Ms. Anderson served as an assistant district attorney in the Suffolk County District Attorney's Office from 1991 through 2002. She spent her last four years in the District Attorney's Office as Chief of the Gang Investigation Unit. Between 2003 and 2017, Ms. Anderson was a principal attorney with the Appellate Division's Grievance Committee, where she investigated and prosecuted attorneys for professional misconduct. Ms. Anderson returned to the District Attorney's Office in January 2018 and is currently a Deputy Bureau Chief serving on the District Attorney's Executive Staff. Going to share my screen. No, wrong one. It's okay, Molly, I can, uh, I think I can go without the, the slide if we have to. Okay, I'll get there. <clears throat> okay, so uh, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us on this uh, Zoom session. It's so important. Um, as Molly said, I am an assistant district attorney here in Suffolk County, and uh, we prosecute cases that are brought by the Human Trafficking Unit led by Detective Sergeant Murphy. Uh, we do that in cooperation with ECLI <clears throat> and the services they provide are absolutely invaluable. They are professionals in a field where no one should have to be a professional. They are able to comfort, um, get victims to cooperate, get victims to tell their stories. And that's vital if we're going to have a successful prosecution. So uh, first of all, I'd like to get us all on the same page with respect to what we're talking about when we say uh, sex trafficking or human trafficking in New York. It falls under New York State Penal Law Section 230.34. And um, uh, excuse me, it's of course, because it's a law, it's written in very long and convoluted, very uninteresting terms. I tried to break it down here to make things a little bit easier so that we can go through them and just make sure that we all understand what we're talking about. So there, uh, the law says a person is guilty of sex trafficking if he or she intentionally advances or profits from prostitution through inducing another person into prostitution by doing one of the following things. So the, the short answer to this is uh, we used to call this being a pimp, right? Now we understand that it's actually sex trafficking and it's written into the law that way. So if you provide an, a specific intoxicating substance to someone in order to force them to, into prostitution, that falls in here. If you make false statements or, or omit to make statements to them that make them feel they have to go into uh, the prostitution, that also falls under this. Something that comes up, especially with uh, undocumented folks, withholding or confiscating a government document the trafficker can actually take the person's immigration papers and refuse to give them back uh, until a certain amount of uh, sexual service is provided. Uh, requiring prostitution as payment for a debt, and often this ties in with the intoxicating substance. Um, the <clears throat> trafficker will get the victim uh, addicted to drugs or play on the person's addiction and then require that their drug debt be repaid through the use of uh, prostitution, through forcing the victim to engage in prostitution. Uh, using a pattern of force or instilling fear, that's the threats, the physical violence that comes with this. Um, 
causing physical injury or death, causing property damage, or engaging in a felony or unlawful um, imprisonment in the second degree. I'm not gonna go into all of that. If, if any of you are interested, you can take a look at uh, 230.34 and see exactly what the story is here. Uh, sometimes what we see is traffickers threatening to call immigration or uh, try to get deportation proceedings introduced against the victim. Uh, or they will make a threat of calling the police or uh, filing criminal charges against them to keep them in the prostitution. Uh, a threat to disclose a secret that'll cause embarrassment. So in, in some uh, circles, I guess this is called, uh, uh, God, the word just left my head. But anyway, um, threatening to say, you know, I'll show those photos that you let me take of you to your family. I'll send them to everybody on your friends list, uh, that sort of thing. Uh, a threat to testify or withhold information on a legal proceeding, revenge porn. Thank you. Somebody put that into the, uh, the chat. My mind completely left me. Yes, revenge porn. Uh, that's the threatening to disclose a secret that'll cause embarrassment. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> excuse me, the threat to testify or withhold information in a legal proceeding. You know, you, you, perhaps the victim has been accused of a crime and the trafficker knows that the victim was actually with him at the time the crime took place. He will not say that. He'll refuse to give that information uh, and use that over the head of the victim to get her to continue in prostitution. Abuse of his or her position as a public servant, which is essentially... Um, you know, running somebody's criminal history as a, a police officer or a prosecutor, or doing something that you're empowered to do because you have a public position and using that to induce or keep somebody in prostitution. And finally, performing an act intended to harm the health, safety, or immigration status of a person. So it's a sort of an all-encompassing statute that we have. Um, if you'd like to take a look at it, as I said, again, it's a little more complex than this, but this is the nuts and bolts of it. So as I said, uh, I'm a prosecutor in the Suffolk County DA's office. And in the past, what we had found is that um, these cases were not recognized as uh, trafficking. They were treated as prostitution cases. And uh, as a result, the victims were treated as uh, criminals. We, when we finally got a handle on the trafficking situation, and that was basically under the new, the, the current DA, Tim Sini, uh, we made a, a substantial shift in the office, and that was we're not prosecuting people for being, uh, for engaging in prostitution. Because what we found is, uh, in many cases, one of these situations that the law covers is the reason that they're engaged in the prostitution. So it's not a voluntary thing. They're actually being forced into this by someone or by the threats of someone else. So... That's where ECLI comes in. That's where the human trafficking unit and the police department come in. Um, ECLI is able to bring these individuals to us and, and oftentimes um, they will make referrals of individuals who are victims that we may not know about. Um, oftentimes because there is an interdependence between the trafficker and the victim, you will see that uh, they may not necessarily be, want to cooperate with law enforcement or with a prosecution. And you have to remember, in a prosecution, they will at some point uh, in all likelihood have to be in the same courtroom with their abuser, with their trafficker. So in order to get them into a situation where they can um, safely do that, where they feel they can be safe in that it, in a courtroom with that person, um, ECLI is able to kind of walk them through the process with us. Um, we, uh, we work very closely with other advocacy organizations as well. Uh, we have assistant district attorneys in the office who are specifically assigned to these cases. So they have been trained specifically. Uh, they have specialized training. Sometimes they go through that with the police to make sure that everybody understands exactly what we're looking for and what we're dealing with. So that is a huge change. There was never anyone in the office detailed specifically to those cases. And that's the situation now. Uh, one of the cases that Sergeant, Detective Sergeant Murphy mentioned was a trafficker who was a gang member uh, who was operating for a period of about four years out of Kings Park of all places, not necessarily the, uh, the hotbed of trafficking that you would expect, but he was operating all over Suffolk County. His name was Abby Adeliki, and he was sentenced to 25 years in prison 
for sex trafficking. That was the extent of his crimes. The other one that uh, Sergeant Murphy mentioned is the Ray Rodeo, who was sentenced to nine and a half years because he was literally keeping women captive in the basement of his parents' house, not even his own house, uh, to the tune of he had them hooked on drugs and uh, to, for simple needs like using the bathroom, he provided them with buckets. So that's the quality of individual we're talking about when we're talking about a, a sex trafficker. Um, our contact information is up on the screen. Uh, I'm Leslie Anderson. If you have anything that you need to bring to our attention, please feel free to do that at infoda at suffolkcountyny.gov. And thank you very much for attending this evening. Thank you so much, Leslie Anderson. We see that the Q&A is buzzing, so this is good. We're getting ready for our discussion at the end of all of our presenters, so keep funneling your questions in there. Next, we have Investigator Sergeant Erin Minkle. She has nearly 20 years of experience in the Suffolk County Sheriff's Office. She is trained in the technique of interviewing and advanced interrogation and is certified as a New York State Division of Criminal Justice Service Criminal Investigator. With the support of Sheriff Talone, she has been simultaneously developing and working in the Sheriff's Anti-Trafficking Initiative, which was established as a division of the Sheriff's Intelligence Bureau 2019. As commanding officer of the Sheriff's Anti-Trafficking Initiative, Erin has been pioneering the campaign against one of the worst underground threats facing marginalized women and girls in our community. She works in collaboration with local, state, and federal law enforcement agencies by developing and sharing the intelligence gleaned from the correctional facility. The unit works closely with advocacy groups and refers the victims to these advocacy groups in efforts to assist them on their road to recovery and support them throughout their long-term journey as survivors. Erin has completed numerous human trafficking courses and conferences and is responsible, along with her team, for in-service training as well as education of new officers on the fundamentals of human trafficking, how to recognize and respond to it. She is also a member of the Suffolk County Anti-Trafficking Initiative Task Force. Thank thanks, you. Thanks, Molly. Um, good evening, everyone, and thanks for inviting and allowing me to speak with you tonight. I'm going to talk a little bit about human trafficking. I know Fetty, Sergeant Murphy, and Leslie have really done a great job going into and covering so much already. Um, I'm going to explain a little bit about what the Sheriff's Office is doing to help combat the crime and help the victims. Um, and I'm going to describe a few examples of how members of the task force working together can affect change. So in general terms, human trafficking is holding someone in compelled service using any means necessary, whether physical or psychological. As Sergeant Murphy mentioned, human trafficking is right here in your town, neighborhood and schools. Um, most of it isn't done on street corners. It's advertised on the Internet. It's done in residential homes in small roadside motels and even larger hotels. In large part, it's been fueled by the opioid crisis. Um, and we know on Long Island, the opioid crisis has been running rampant. It affects all walks of life, any age, race, or gender, basically anyone vulnerable to exploitation. The easy targets are those that lack healthy relationships, those with drug addictions, mental health issues, the homeless and runaways that can easily disappear and go unnoticed, and the LGBT youth. The victims that we see mostly in our facility are born and raised in our communities. They're our neighbors, nieces, nephews, our children's classmates. And the traffickers are master manipulators. Sometimes they're a drug dealer, sometimes the kid next door. They're targeting the victims. They learn about what the victim is missing in life, about what's gonna appeal to them and they use that while grooming. The recruiting is happening at the malls by you, the train stations, the drug treatment centers and sober houses, the group homes and shelters, the schools, and more than ever now with distance learning, it's happening online through social media. After realizing the prevalence in Suffolk County and more specifically in our jail population, we realized that we were in a unique position to help the victims and to develop information to help prosecute traffickers. 
the sheriff's anti-trafficking initiative began to develop a comprehensive response to the crime from a correctional standpoint. In 2018, Sheriff Toulon, after seeing the work and the number of inmates that were affected and involved, formally established the SADI unit. Since inception, SADI has conducted over 2,000 interviews, identified 168 victims and 113 traffickers. While most of these individuals were previously known to other agencies, several victims and traffickers were not. So this information coupled with other data mined during interviews led to over 300 referrals for various services. Our principal objectives are first and foremost to ensure that all the victims that pass through our facility are identified, have access to the services that they need to recover and are supported throughout their long-term journey as survivors. Secondly, we aim to assist in enhancing investigations and prosecutions. Through intelligence gathering and the use of investigative tools, we've been able to glean and share actionable information with our federal, state, and local law enforcement partners. We work closely with Sergeant Murphy and his unit in the Suffolk County Police Department, with Suffolk County Probation, the District Attorney's Office, FBI, Homeland Security, and several advocacy groups, one main organization being Empowerment Collaborative of Long Island. The Sheriff's Office role in combating human trafficking is that we place a strong emphasis on identifying the victims and gathering information to first ensure safety while they're in our facility. Procedurally, all the incoming females during routine booking and intake are screened using a human trafficking screening form which we developed. The form is designed to highlight any red flags or indicators that the trafficking might be present. And as, as Sergeant Murphy had said earlier, if we can notice these signs sooner, maybe we can prevent some further victimization. After a few days, the females are then interviewed by an investigator in our human trafficking unit. And um, this is a very different kind of interview. It requires you know, an investigator with patience and empathy because most of the trafficking victims have experienced multiple traumas, as Fetty mentioned. Um, a lot of them have history of abuse and or mental health disorders. At the jail, we're in like a unique position to build a rapport with the victims while they're in our facility because they happen to just be here, you know, a little longer. A lot of times they enter our facility with substance abuse issues, high and addicted to drugs. And we take this time during their withdrawals to build a rapport while getting them the care that they need. During our interview process, we'll work to identify the areas that the inmate needs assistance with and we'll make referrals based on that information. Send weekly emails to everyone just you know, noting you know, what each individual might need. Um, we provide them with immediate in-custody support which includes medical, mental health, counseling, substance abuse treatment, education assistance, reentry planning, or placement into a variety of other programs that we have uh, and rehabilitative services. While in custody, um, we'll connect them with advocacy groups like ECLI who can provide them with an array of different resources, legal advocacy, assistance with social services, assistance with obtaining their ID documents because a lot of times these victims will have had their identification taken from their traffickers as a form of control. Um, and upon discharge, the advocates also assist with shelter, transportation, food, and clothing. Many girls don't even have these basic necessities. And without these services and help, a lot of times they would wind up right back with their traffickers. Uh, last year, the Sheriff's Office, ECLI, and Family Court began offering another service to incarcerated victims of human trafficking and domestic violence. The service provides access to the court for purposes of obtaining a protective order remotely. So in instances where a human trafficking victim or any inmate requests a temporary order of protection, the Sheriff's Office, with the help of ECLI and Family Court, will be able to facilitate this and have it in place before the inmate even leaves our facility. Uh, Sadie holds seminars at the jail also for our female inmate, inmates, um, where we collaborate with ECLI, Sanctuary for Families, um, the Police Department, and District Attorney's Office. The purpose of these seminars are to educate the women on signs of human trafficking. Many don't know what human trafficking is. They don't even realize that they're victims half the time. Uh, they don't know about the resources that are out there to help them. 
and many are untrusting of law enforcement. We are working tirelessly to change that perception. We've had successful endeavors where the girls have come forward following this seminar. <clears throat> We've been able to connect the victims with ECLI for counseling and services that they need to rebuild their lives. We were able to connect, make that connection with the Suffolk Police Department's um, human trafficking detectives. And in some cases, we're able to identify previously unknown traffickers on the street. I think this is an optimal example of what can be accomplished when a trusting partnership like the SCADI task force has been formed and cultivated. Um, another example of collaboration was a fil facilitation of the safe release of one of our victims. Due to information sharing between partners, uh, we were able to detect that it was the victim's trafficker who was actually attempting to bail her out. We were able to immediately connect her with members of ECLI, Suffolk Police Department and FBI, resulting in her wanting assistance in transportation to a safe house upon discharge. We were able to facilitate this safe release. We are super proud to be a member of the task force. Um, it brings together a network of organizations, providers, victim advocates, faith-based groups, educators, federal, state, local government. Um, everyone involved does share the commitment to a victim center approach in providing comprehensive services, investigations, and prosecutions. I think we've come a long way in working together and these couple examples show only a small slice of what can be accomplished in combating this crime when everyone is to, comes together for the same goal. So once again, I'd like to thank you for inviting me to talk and everyone have a great evening. And it's really read, nice to see you, Tatiana. I'm so happy you're doing well. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much, Sergeant Minkle. All right, next up we have Lois Roman. She is an attorney with a general practice in Hopog, New York, and a strong interest in gender equality or equity, sorry, and environmental issues. Mrs. Roman is an active member of the Suffolk County Anti-Trafficking Initiative, as well as a member of the Zonta Club Suffolk County chapter. Ms. Roman works to advance the status of women locally and worldwide through service and advocacy. She serves on the board of directors of the Coastal Steward Long Island, is a member of the Suffolk County Women's Bar Association, as well as the Suffolk County and New York State Bar Association. Over to you. Thank you, Molly. Um, good evening, everyone. I'm Lois Roman. Um, and before I begin my presentation, I'd like to uh, thank you for coming on behalf of the Zonta Club of Suffolk County, which is hosting the webinar. Um, and just to tell you a little bit about Zonta, because I have my 10 minutes, um, we are an international organization that's over 100 years old and has worked for the last 100 years to advance the status of women worldwide through service and advocacy. Um, there's uh, about 1,100 clubs in 62 countries and regions. Um, we are a member of the UN as a non-governmental organization as well as a participant in the Council of Europe. Uh, we partner with other agencies such as UN Women and UNICEF to support initiatives that um, improve the lives of women and girls, uh, such as programs to end child marriage, to prevent violence against women, and of course, to end human trafficking. We work locally in, in local clubs, uh, on hands-on projects and to raise money and awareness of local issues. And the money we raise, we, we send up the food chain to Zonta International to support those international efforts, which require a lot of money. Um, if you're interested in learning more about Zonta, you can feel free to, to contact me. I'll put my contact information in the chat, or you could uh, look for zonta.org uh, on the World Wide Web. So the other hat I wear is as a private attorney and a member of SCADI. And uh, I started my career as an assistant district attorney here in Suffolk County. And a few years ago, I left the DA's office and uh, started my own general practice where I do, now I do criminal defense, as well as intellectual property law. I work as a hearing officer. Um, but more importantly, I work with ECLI uh, through a grant that they received to provide legal services for the victims of human trafficking and ECLI clients. 
as a participant in SCADI, I bring a unique perspective because I, I'm not law enforcement, although I was. I'm not a, an advocate in the term of a social advocate, um, but I am a legal advocate for the victims. Uh, one of the first things I try to do is untangle the story uh, that these victims tell um, and try to identify their legal needs, which oftentimes they're not even aware they have these legal needs until it, they're in the, in the crux of it. Many clients have legal liability um, as well as a host of other legal issues. So I may be addressing issues for the clients that have to do with family court, child support, custody issues. Um, many, many of the victims have traffic violations and fines and they don't have licenses. Um, and so I try to remedy some of these problems that have developed through the years that they were being prostituted and taken advantage of. So it, it's, it's a challenge sometimes, um, but one of the main things that we're focusing on uh, at ECLI with the victims is trying to vacate some of the criminal convictions. And I wanna talk a little bit about that because um, I think it was uh, Leslie touched on something about law enforcement is no longer prosecuting prostitution, okay? So the victims aren't being arrested for prostitution or loitering for prostitution anymore. They're not being convicted of those charges. And here is a, an area where we really need some advocacy to change the law. There is a vacatur law that allows victims of human trafficking to have their convictions vacated. But the law says those convictions have to be for prostitution and maybe if you're lucky related offenses. So um, we're working with victims now, not everybody has a prostitution related conviction, right? So we have to, we have to tell the story to the court and try to convince the court that these other convictions are worth vacating. And, and many of those convictions could be for drug possession, petty larceny, drug sales, things like that. Even violent crimes like assault or, or DWI or any number of crimes that the victims may have committed either willingly or, or unwillingly during the course of their uh, being taken advantage of. So, um, the other thing that's important in this case is that the, the people who we can seek vacatur for have to be certified victims, right? They have to actually have helped out with law enforcement, either uh, cooperated with the police or the DA's office, or be involved in an appropriate advocacy group that can say that, yes, these people really are victims of human trafficking, and it's not just them claiming to be you know, th there's all these provisions. Nobody wants to give away free vacatures of their convictions, right? So you really got to prove you are being victimized. Um, the victims also need to become survivors, right? They have to be out of the situation. They have to be clean and sober and have moved on in their life. Um, and then once they're there, they have to tell us the gory details of their story, right? Because we need that story in order to put it in the motion in order to make a compelling argument for the court to vacate those convictions. And, and that can be a very challenging uh, project for the victims to actually tell this story. Um, but it's really important, and I'm, I'm bringing up this issue of vacature because the criminal convictions that the survivors have prevents them from living a full life. And, and many of you who are involved in the criminal justice system know that to be true for anybody who has criminal convictions. No one wants to hire you if you have a rap sheet and you've been convicted of drug sales or, or larceny or assault. Um, so it's really important that we, we get this underway and try to clear some of those convictions so that people can move on with their lives. Um, so, the other thing that is, is really very important, and, and again, um, Leslie and Aaron both brought some of these topics up, is the cooperation end of it. Uh, so what I try to do is work with the clients when they are involved in, uh, in the prosecution of the perpetrators. There's often not a lot of trust 
between the police and law enforcement and the district attorney's office and these victims. Um, they've spent years involved in illegal activities and the, the culture on the street is not one of sharing um, unless they're getting some benefit, right? And, and that still happens. I mean, there, there are people who are out there who are still in the life and they're still being pressed for information from the police and maybe getting a benefit, maybe not getting a benefit. Um, so in those situations where they're still actively kind of prostituting, either, you know, they're being prostituted, they're using drugs, they still need some legal advice because, you know, it, it's one thing to be helpful to law enforcement and we want to encourage that, but you have to be smart about that, right? There have to be protections for these people who are, who are basically admitting to committing crimes, right? They're, they're confessing. Um, so I try to put myself in the middle of that a little bit to uh, law enforcement's uh, big chagrin and, and uh, no, we work together well, but it is difficult because it sometimes is adversarial because they may need non-prosecution agreements, right? If, if they wanna come in and tell this story they, they don't want to be arrested for it, right? Um, they need other kinds of cooperation agreements. Maybe they have open cases that they want to have some benefit if they're going to cooperate. Uh, so that's where I come in and I try to make sure that they get those protections that they need uh, in order to cooperate. Um, the other thing is it can be very, very dangerous for victims and survivors to cooperate, right? And, and there are protections uh, available to them. And so when they can express to me their concerns, then I can try to get in touch with Sergeant Murphy or, or, or Leslie or the prosecutor in the DA's office to try to make sure that they're protected, get them panic buttons if they need panic buttons, get them some kind of treatment if they need treatment or whatever it may be. Um, to keep them safe, move them out of a situation. Uh, so it's also important to understand, again, the culture on the street of these people cooperating and being rats, it's not a healthy place to be. Uh, so, so it's important that they're protected and that their identities are protected and that they're not put in a situation where they're at risk because they wanna help. Um, so, you know, the, the repercussions for the, for the victims and the survivors of helping can be really significant. But their assistance in the prosecution is crucial. The prosecutors can't make the case if they don't have witnesses and they don't have victims to come forward. So this is where it's, it's helpful that I was a prosecutor because I understand the prosecutor's dilemma. They have a story that they have to tell and it's a legal story. And it varies significantly from the story that the victims and the survivors wanna tell, right? They have their story that they think is really important and the details that they think are really important that we know, but they're really not legally important in the case sometimes, right? And so it's hard to get for the prosecutor sometimes to get the story in a way that they can prove the elements of the crime. They have to prove that that person was induced into prosecution by force, fraud, or coercion. What do those words mean? Half the time the victims don't even know what that means. I've had, I've had victims tell me they didn't know what prostitution was, okay? They didn't know what that was, that that word was. Because um, don't forget, the, the age that a lot of these people get involved is very young, 13, 14, 15 years old. They don't know what prostitution is. They're not, they're not of the world yet. And then they stay in this other world and they don't learn that, right? So, so it's important to explain what's going on. And, you know... I think Erin said that the, 
the trust, you know, you want to build trust with the, with the clients, right? And it's very, very hard because they don't trust law enforcement. So that is where I can help. They can trust me because I'm not law enforcement, right? And then I can help them tell the story. And there are limitations on what the prosecutor can say to a witness, right? They can't coach a witness on what to say. They can't tell them what to say. The first thing the defense attorney is gonna say when the witness is on the stand was, how many times did you talk to the prosecutor and did they tell you what to say? You know, and that undermines the whole case. So the prosecutor can't tell them what to say, right? I have attorney client privilege, right? They can't be forced to disclose what we talk about. And I know what the elements of the crime are. I know what the prosecutor is trying to get out of them. So I can help them, I help them frame the narrative in a way so that the prosecutor can hopefully get a conviction and do it in a way that doesn't hurt the victim more because it's, it's really important that we protect them during this process. It's traumatic for a victim to get on the witness stand. If any of you out there have ever testified or sworn under oath to do anything, it's really where the rubber meets the road in terms of telling the truth. And it's terrifying for normal people. And when you're spilling your guts about intimate things that have happened to you and telling stories of, of rape and assault and, and drug use and things that you're not proud of, it's very, very difficult to tell that story. Um, so one of the things that I do is I spend time with the clients and I hear the story and then I try to help them frame it in a way so that the convictions can, can stick, so that they can get the convictions and the convictions can stick. And I know uh, Fetty talked about the trauma bonding, you know, and it's, it, you really do see that with a lot of the, the victims that don't understand that the, their actions were not their own free will, you know, and they, they don't have to protect their pimp. They, they, it's my boyfriend, I don't wanna hurt him. He didn't really hurt me when he threw me down the stairs. Well, you know, he really did hurt you when he threw you down the stairs. And that kind of discussion is what I have with the client, you know, to make them understand that what they kind of consider as routine behavior for the pimp does constitute force, fraud, and coercion. And that they, they weren't willing participants. And it takes a long time for them to come to that realization. And they, you know, working with the advocates to kind of, you know, get the mental health treatment and the drug treatment and the psychological treatment that they need so that they come to that understanding is really, really important. So um, I just want to wrap up quickly. I don't want to take too much time um, by saying that, you know, with SCADI, bringing together all of these different organizations, um, I'm really thankful that they include me because I do think I bring a perspective that is not law enforcement, not social services, um, but a legal perspective that is, I'm here for the client, you know, I'm here for the victim and I don't have an agenda to put away the pimp Exactly. I mean, that's not my agenda there. It is my goal. It's all of our goal. Um, but I'm there for, for the survivors and to help them with what they need and their legal, uh, their legal needs. And, and those legal needs, again, are, are varied. Um, but my main purpose for being there is to put away the bad guys and to help the victims through that process. So for that, I'm very thankful for being uh, part of SCADI. And, um, and I'm happy to be here tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Lois Roman. All right, our next panelist is Senior Probation Officer Jill Porter. She has been a member of the Suffolk County Probation Department for over 20 years. She began as a prob probation investigator working in the Col Cohalon Court Complex. 
After noticing a large number of gang members involved in the court system, she developed gang training for the probation department staff and other organizations. She was able to secure a grant at the time and started the first probation department gang unit in the state. In 2015, Officer Porter realized that the only difference between gang members now and the gang members when she started 20 years ago was the age of the gang member. Officer Porter started the Strong Change Pilot Program to address the need for early prevention. Supported by Tim Seney as the police commissioner then and now the DA, he continues to expand Officer Porter's mission of keeping youth out of gangs and giving them positive alternatives through the Strong Change Program. The program continues to expand throughout the county. There has been much success with the program and it is expected to develop uh, in conjunction with the DA's office. Oh, sorry, in April 2018, another new program was developed in conjunction with the DA's office called Life Here in the United States. Jill not only developed the current gang awareness programs and gang prevention programs being utilized in Suffolk County, but she is hands-on and active in all areas of gang prevention and intervention, including working with victims of trafficking issues. Similarly to her work with gangs, Officer Porter saw the real need for a coordinated community response to addressing trafficking in Suffolk County. The ages at which young girls and boys are joining the life of trafficking was astonishing. Over the last two years, Officer Porter has been advocating for housing and support services for victims of human trafficking here on Long Island. She's determined to inform our schools and parents of the trends we are seeing locally in terms of trafficking so that we can prevent and intervene before it's too late. Officer Jill Porter, I'm going to share my screen. You're up. Hi, everybody. Um, my name is Jill Porter. Um, I am a Suffolk County probation officer. For the past 25 years, I've been working with gang members. And about four years ago, I started work, working with trafficking victims. It turns out that a lot of my gang members got into the sex trafficking business. So what is sex trafficking? I asked myself that same thing when I walked into my first meeting and had no idea what anybody was talking about. So an easy way to understand it is this. The words trafficking or trafficked is the same as the words prostituting or prostituted. The word prostitute makes the person appear to be the criminal. Law enforcement and victims advocacy groups have moved away from the word prostitution and are substituting it with the words human trafficking victim survivor, HTV, because this person is actually the victim. HT or human trafficker is what we used to call the pimp. He's the criminal. Females and males can both be trafficked. One of the biggest issues we encounter is that we have no place for our victim survivors to live if we need to remove them from this situation. Suffolk County Probation Department applied for a grant, which we were awarded last month. It is the 2020 federal grant called Integrated Services for Minor Victims of Sex Trafficking. The grant is $1.3 million a year. Only four jurisdictions in the entire nation received this award. Suffolk County Probation Department cannot do this alone. ECLI, EAC, and Mercy First are just a few of the agencies that we will be collaborating with. The best part of this award is that most of the funding will go towards a dedicated house for our survivors. The Suffolk County Probation Department has dedicated probation officers who work with human trafficking survivors that have been placed on probation. These probation cases are rehabilitative, not punitive. We do a lot of advocacy. These probation officers are in constant contact with them and in constant contact with agencies like ECLI. I probably talk to Fetty or Jen three times a day. We, are, we all work very closely with the Suffolk County uh, Sheriff's Office Trafficking Unit who may have previously worked with the survivor. We like to think that we form a safety circle around them. In addition, probation does outreach with our partners in the community, um, in communities, with families, schools, all community organizations, and anyone who reaches out for help. No one is turned away. Collaboration is the most important aspect of working with this population. Our work is also about prevention. Not only do, um, do I do 
presentations in schools for children as young as fourth, fifth, and sixth grade regarding gangs. We also do um, presentations. We include part of that having to do trafficking, depending upon how young um, the children are. Will depend upon how we talk to them about it. So I do a lot of presentations with with Betty and ECLI. So we do them for the faith-based communities, CBOs, which are community-based organizations, and all of those, anybody who interacts with our children. We need to talk to our children when they, when they are very young, letting them know this is a very horrible life to get into, letting them know that they have a voice and that there is someone who will listen. Much of sex trafficking starts via electronics. Parents need to know what their children are doing on social media and whom they are talking to. We talk to our children about not speaking to strangers, not getting into cars with strangers, but we don't explain that strangers are on electronics too. Most youth talk to people on social media, they think that they know that person. If they have never seen that person next to them, then they are strangers, period. We need to teach this to them when they are very young. Changes in behavior, such as leaving the home for days, having new expensive items, nails, hair done with no monetary means to obtain those items, are a few of the, so red, uh, the signs that are red flags. This is the kind of outreach that we do. To the law school students or attorneys that are out there listening, we know that winning a case is important, but sometimes with these cases, you winning a case for your client may actually be a loss for them. Sometimes getting them a lesser charge and a lesser sentence like task or an ACOD is not what they need. Probation may just be the answer. They will be placed with the probation officer who works with the survivors. She will get them the services that they so desperately need. Sometimes even GPS may be helpful because traffickers do not like bracelets on their trafficking their females or their males. Therefore, when you have one of these cases, the definition of winning may mean something else. We win if we can help save the lives of these individuals. Thank you for your time, I appreciate it. Thank you so much, Jill Porter. All right, now I'd like you in like to introduce you to our next panelist, Tatiana. She's here to speak to us about her experiences as a survivor of human trafficking. Hello, don't mind me, I'm stuffing my face with tangerine. Um, I just wanted to go on board saying, I love Sergeant Murphy and Betty. You guys are awesome. Um, I'm Tatiana, I'm 27 years old and I am a sex trafficking survivor. I say survivor because I am no longer in that life. But um, a lot of the things you guys mentioned uh, as far as being abused as a child and you know being taken advantage of later on in life, all that has valid points and is very, very true. And I can say that because I've lived it. From the age of three to seven years old, I was being molested by my uncle, my grandma's brother, along with my brother, his, my cousins, it was five of us. My cousin became a gangbanger. My cousin Shamina is no longer alive because she was a prostitute and ended up addicted to drugs. I, one of my cousins is gay, has AIDS, and my brother right now is doing 15 to 25. I ended up getting neglected at 13 years old by my mom when my dad passed away and she left me, abandoned me and left me in a house alone at 13 years old. I fell in love with someone who I thought was my friend and she said that he was her uncle and he was not her uncle, he was her pimp. And when I saw them having intercourses one day, he beat the crap out of me, drugged me and had me gang raped in a hotel. I didn't have my own life. I thought that I was going to be there forever, 
long story short, it got to the point where um, I'm 27 years old now. I am going on, what, two years of being without that in my life. And the only reason why is because I put myself in jail on purpose to get out of that. And if I did not meet Fetty, he would have been the person standing outside waiting for me. Instead, I had someone who cared about me, who saw me hurting saw I wanted better and was the person to pick me up outside knowing I had no family I had no support I had no one who cared about me and she guided me I was lost I mean when she took me to a Dunkin Donuts and I literally felt the walls closing in on me and I couldn't stand there for two seconds because I literally looked at her and was like I can't breathe I felt that way I had to walk out and if it wasn't for her I wouldn't have my daughter to this day who I have with me now. Um, I'm here because you guys are doing something important. You're recognizing, you're noticing, you're seeing that our generation has changed. It is not the same way it used to be. We have pedophiles going left and right. This, this sex trafficking thing is right under our noses. It's to the point where now it's almost a regular thing to everyone. You know, and I'm not here for me. I'm not here for me. I'm not looking for a beneficial. I'm not looking for a way out. I, I If it's cool, it's cool that you guys do things for me. That's awesome. I love it because, you know, I feel like it's, it's a give and take kind of thing. And we give each other and we love each other back. You know, it's just a society thing. We're supposed to care about each other. And that's where people lost their way. But I'm here because I have a daughter who's five. I went to school for her. And I had the New York State send me a letter after I graduated saying, you're a threat to society. Due to something I had no choice but to do. I was getting my head banged in with guns, my ribs caged in. Like, I was scared for my life for a very, very, very long time. And I'm still trying. And I'm still not turning back. And I'm still trying to help other girls. And I'm that kind of person that if I know that girl's hurting, I'll send her to Fetty. Like, you know what I mean? I just... Not, it's just, it just sucks, I guess. I don't, I don't really know what to say at this point. It's, I'm healed a lot. I've healed a lot. And it's all because of having support and love and everything these pimps are saying that they're going to provide for you. I'll give you food. I'll give you clothing. I'll give you care. I'll give you that. Here's a car in your name, but he takes it right from you as soon as you don't want him anymore. You know what I mean? Like, it's just crazy. And it sucks that now that I've moved on with my life and I am a survivor, I can't move on fully because the things that he's done to me and made me do are haunting my future. And I have a five-year-old that I'm looking at and I'm like, I'd be damned if like someone ever did something like that to you. I'd be damned. Like literally later, like just yesterday, I took her to a physical, for example, perfect example. And the doctor was checking her. And the doctor goes, I'm, I'm looking at her and I'm like, you know why she's touching you there, right? And, she, and I said, because mommy's right here and she's a doctor. And that's the only reason why. But what happens if someone touches you there and no one's around? She goes to the doctor and me, you're going to kill them. <laughs> and the lady started freaking laughing. She started laughing. She's like, I love that. I do speak to my daughter about things like that because I went through it and no one cared when I was going through it. And I feel like you guys are the root to making all of that happen. You have higher power. You are the bosses. You are, you know, the judges, the lawyers, the, the police officers. You can see this, these things and make a change in our lives, in our future. If you just have someone like me who cares enough to tell you what to look out for. And that's why I'm here today. It's just, a, you tell me what you need me to do and I'll make sure we go to the right direction. We'll make it happen because this is not okay. These are our souls. It affects me all the time. I, I'm so strong, yes, but I break down a lot. It affects my everyday relationships. PTSD, like you will have no understanding or it doesn't go away. You just, you're either strong or you're not. And 
that's not okay. It's not okay. I just want you guys to understand that you guys have a very, very important part to play in all of this. And whatever you need my help in, I will tell you fully, honestly, and full heartedly. Because it's not okay. And I have a daughter and she's a girl. And I'm pretty sure you guys have grandkids and other kids and you look at them and you're like, you deserve the world. without being looked at the wrong way or taken advantage of because someone in your household didn't love you enough to care. Foster homes aren't the answer either because I've been in foster homes. And as soon as the lady that comes to check on you every two weeks leaves, they cash that check and they leave and then the guy's molesting you in that room. I've seen it. It's happened to me. It's happened to my friends. And the people that act like they care the most are the ones that are sitting around driving around in Lamborghinis and foreigns and stuff. We, we just have to care. And don't scare them away by saying, you know, you tell me who this person is, they're scared for their lives, okay? I was scared for my life. All I can do and all I can say is, um, everyone deserves a chance. Everyone deserves a chance. And you guys have the power to do that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Tatiana. We really appreciate your words. You're very welcome. There's a lot of messages in the chat coming through right now too. Oh, all right. Collective. Any questions? <laughs> Any questions? We're gonna open it up now. Okay. Yeah. All right. I just wanna read a few of the comments first. It says, Tatiana, thank you so much for sharing your powerful story. Tatiana is why we do what we do, says Sergeant Murphy. You're brave, very brave of you to speak. Love him. Oh my God, he's my life at one point. He literally did. Just to tell you guys a quick story. Um, it was after I even got out of jail. I, I befriended some, this, this goes to show for everyone. When you leave that life, you have to cut everybody off. Even the people you cared about at one point. Because there was a specific person who was in that life still. And the pimp used her as a pawn to get to me. I woke up in Connecticut about to be served to someone else. Do you know what I did? I shared, if I did not have Betty and Murphy in my life, back into the life I would have went. I shared my location because I did not want to be there. And within two, within like maybe five minutes, I had two police officers open the freaking doors, pull me out, pull him out, and get me on a ferry and right back to Murphy. But my soul would have been lost all over again if it wasn't for that man. He is a beautiful, beautiful person. And the only reason why I feel comfortable enough to share my story is because he and Betty are sitting here. And they've proven themselves worthy of being trusted. They have. Well, thank you so much. You said something about um, society, like a simple thing that society needs to care. 
I just want to hear from you or the panelists about if you could identify one way to get society to care, a simple act, what would that one way be? A simple act is even asking, are you okay? That's a start. If you see someone, you know when it's right and when it's wrong. Just ask if they're okay. And if they want, if they want your help, they're gonna tell you right then and there. Cause you know, you could take the horse to the water but you can't make them drink it. But anyone that's hurting that much is not gonna go seeking for it. They're scared. But if you hold their hand and you look at them and you assure them that you're gonna make sure that they're taking care of the minute they open their mouth and they say, I'm not okay, they will go. Tatiana, can I jump in real quick? Absolutely. <clears throat> Molly, uh, Tatiana told me a story one time about when she was in school and how bad a shape she was in. And she explained that there is, there is no way that nobody noticed. Sitting by herself, hygiene was terrible and that was on purpose. So she wouldn't be found attractive to the people that were buying sex from her when she was 13, 14 years old. Um, she would eat by herself in the cafeteria. All she said to me was, I just needed one person to take me aside by myself and ask if I was okay. And she would have just let it all out and explained what was going on. She just needed one person to show that they cared because she didn't have one person in her life. She just needed one person to say, T, are you okay? That's no. it. And she would have broke down. That would have been a guidance counselor, a teacher, a substitute, somebody just to grab her by the arm and say, girl, are you okay? That's all we need is to, 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 to see it, to open your eyes. And, and it's okay to reach out to somebody and say, are you okay? Even though if, if you can't fix them, get it out and then find somebody that can. Yeah. Thank you. Simple, simple, powerful words. I think, I, I think we have to recognize that um, awareness is key. What we're doing tonight and we're sharing with, you know, you know, almost a hundred people tonight. Um, sorry for the dog, but it's really important that we get this out there. I mean, I've, I've been in court and I've heard attorneys and judges talking about um, the human trafficking intervention court, which we didn't discuss tonight, but there's a special treatment court for victims of human trafficking. And we weren't in that courtroom. We were in another courtroom and the attorney asked the judge, what, what is this human trafficking intervention court? And the response from the judge was, it's a solution without a problem. That's what he said. The judge said, this is a solution without a problem, completely unaware that there was human trafficking, sex trafficking going on in Suffolk County in the very courthouse on the same floor where we were. They had no awareness of it. The crazy part is on top of that is um, I personally don't trust a lot of lawyers and judges and police enforcement because I witnessed myself being incarcerated. Lawyers come up to me and say, I will get you out of here. If you come meet me at the hotel, I'll get you high. Do you know what I'm saying? But you're supposed to be the person that's supposed to protect us. When I say they don't make them like Murphy no more, they really don't. I'm like, I don't, I don't, I can't, I can't, I can't. It's disgusting. There's, you guys don't only have to look at what's going on in the world. You have to look at what's going on in your own bureaus too. There's a lot of crooked things that are going on in there. And you know what they're doing? They're, they're only making it worse. They're making it worse. They're making it okay. And those, those are also the guys that are calling the pimps when they're off work to meet with the girls that are being incarcerated for the charges that they're getting. What kind of, what kind of like life is that? There's a lot going on. 
you guys a lot. I can tell you, Tatiana, that we know about it. Thank it's God that we know about it. It's no, disgusting. we've had this conversation about <laughs> the gag. No, but we talk about the bad lawyers and the bad judges and the bad doctors and the bad- I'll name some of them. Don't even get me started. <laughs> I'll snitch on them. We're working on it. Mm. I have a question from the Q&A from the audience. Are motel and hotel operators and staff compelled to report anything suspicious? Um, actually, a lot of the people in the motels and a lot of people that are staff in the hotels and stuff like that, they know what's going on. But they're paid cash under the table. They'll give you the room for three days as long as you're paying them cash. They're okay with it. And they don't put it under the pimp's name. They put it under the girl's names. Just like they do the cars and the houses and the bank accounts. I'll, I'll jump in again on this one to Tatiana. Um, they don't have to report it. What we've been doing is trying to get to each motel and hotel and talk to the staff as well as the management and explain to them what's going on in the hotels and to see what's going on there. Um, yes, there are some uh, motels that are, are dirty and they're cooperating. And um, those are, are definitely places that are under investigation. Uh, we also have some hotels that have been fantastic. And when they see something, they give us a call. They let us know. Uh, they ask if we're aware. Um, they'll give us the plates and the information. And, and we'll start an investigation into those people. So some of the hotels are doing a really good job with us. So we're making a change. I yes. love that. Yay. <laughs> this is good. I want to jump in here, yeah. too. Um, because one of the things that Zonta does is mm -hmm. raise this issue with the hotel industry and different clubs around the Northeast and have been active in training hotel employees about this issue, placing material in the ladies' rooms of the hotels about uh, if you're a victim of trafficking with the hotline number uh, that can be called. Um, so Zonta is on the forefront of this in terms of getting the hotel industry on board with reporting this and being aware of it and providing some safe space for the victims when they see it. Um, so there are, nobody's compelled to do it, but I think that Tatiana, you made the point about if we appeal to people's kind nature, their better nature, there are good people who don't yes. want to see this in their community. And yes. if they just need the tools. Absolutely. A hundred percent. And not for nothing, once again, I don't do this for me, it, it, more so than anything, just helping and being able to be like a person from the inside, personally, that's what heals me. Knowing that I didn't go through what I went through for no reason and knowing that I was strong enough to get out of it with my sanity at least intact to some degree because I'm a little loca sometimes, you know, <laughs> but who isn't? And being able to help others. That is what helps me heal. That's what helps me be better. I just so want to so happy that we're making changes like this. This is great. I just want to jump in and say that um, Tatiana is like my hero. Like she, love you. All of us, all of my survivors, all of the individuals I work with are are literally my heroes. It's why I wake up and do what I do every day. Because if not, I probably just would give up. But I want to I want to do say something um, in terms of the the fight that we have ongoing. Um, on Long Island, it is so important that you guys that are in the audience really take a look at who's on this panel because every single person did it with no incentive. They realized that there was an issue and they took it on without any payment, without any um, uh, incentive without a pay raise, without any of it. We took on these issues because we saw that no one uh, was doing it, that people weren't talking about it, and we decided uh, to take it on. And that is what almost every single person that is on our SCADI task force have in common. 
There is not one person that does it because they want something out of it. And I think that's important. And the reason why I say that is because if we're going to do this in our schools, and if we're going to do this in our community, and if we're going to do this in other organizations and governmental agencies, we need to be picking the right people to do it. It does not matter if we have a great structure or protocol, if we don't have the right people, it will fall through the cracks and it will not serve a purpose. So I just wanna make sure that I make that very, very clear. And thank you, Kathy, for everything. I love you to death, you're awesome. <laughs> we have a question about bail reform. This might be for um, Jill Porter or for Sergeant Minkle. Does human trafficking fall under the bail reform? How has it been affected? That might be also be Leslie Anderson too. Or Leslie. So um, <clears throat> when bail reform first came into play in January of 2020, uh, sex trafficking was not included as an offense where bail could be set. Uh, there was a revision in April, I believe it was it, it take, took effect in April of 2020, and it is now covered as an, an offense where bail can be set. Thank you. So if the bail is set um, and the, the person who's being trafficked, the trafficking victim is in jail, how can she avoid, if she wants to stay in jail because she feels safer there, I was speaking with a client about this, how can she avoid, um, what can she do to avoid getting bailed out by her pimp? We, uh, well, when I say uh, sex trafficking was covered, I, I was talking about the trafficker. Um, <clears throat> the victim would not be arrested for sex trafficking. She would have to be arrested for an offense that is covered by bail reform that, that allows bail to be set on her. Um, we don't have, the DA's office doesn't have control over that. I think it would, the sheriff's department may be able to answer that question a little bit better. Sure, so um, being that we speak to every new individual that comes in our facility, um, these are topics that we address as they're coming in. Um, sometimes, you know, um, their first interview with us, you know, we, we really haven't broken that ground yet and we don't get that information uh, as to whether they're involved in something like this. Um, sometimes it takes, you know, multiple interviews, but um, eventually, you know, if they come forward and this is an issue that they're concerned about, uh, we make sure that we put all of those um, safety nets in place. Um, just as the, that example I spoke about earlier, um, when we knew about the trafficking victim, um, had been sharing information with um, one of the detectives in Sergeant Murphy's unit, um, and ECLI, and we were able to determine that, okay, the, the, the person who works out where the bails get paid, she knew, you know, noticed that it was something a little off. And once we looked into who was bailing this inmate out, um, we were able to sit her down, notify her, this is who's bailing her out. And she was able to express some concerns, you know, um, that she didn't want to leave with that person. So we make every effort on our end um, to speak to the individual. Um, and, you know, um, as um, somebody had spoken earlier about, you know, we train all the staff that's coming on and the signs to look for. So if we know about it, um, then we'll do everything that we can to prevent that from happening, if that's what they want. That's actually really good that you guys are doing that because I am, do you even know how alone you have to feel in the world to be arrested on purpose in order to get out of the game? Yeah. That's I mean, intense. And to have the person know that he personally himself can't come. He's not going to come himself. He's going to send other people to try to bail you out. So talking to that person directly is definitely a must. Yeah. What's you important know? to know, though, is that the bail reform most of the crimes that the victims would be arrested for, they will no, no longer be held um, unless, so the only way they're gonna be in jail at this point is after a conviction for assault or drug use, you know, drug possession 
or something like that. Right. Most of the victims that had been arrested up until this January, they could be held, but since January, they're released. So, so that avenue, and and I know that that Sergeant Murphy and and uh, Sergeant Munkle, you you guys know that jail has saved many lives, yeah. and yes. and it's it's a, both a tool to save people, but it's a punishment. So it's a fine line, and now that tool to save people is gone. So yeah. it's it makes it all the more challenging for us working with the victims to get them away and safe somewhere. Um, so, you know, we need more safe places for them to go when they're confronted in a situation and removed from the situation, they're not gonna be arrested and put in jail. You guys could just yeah. give me a big mansion and I'll take care of them all, I promise. <laughs> Sadly. I'll do it. <laughs> um, it, def it definitely is a um, it definitely is a double edged sword because um, you're right. So many girls have told us that jail saved their lives, and we're not getting them um, right away anymore. They're only coming in um, unless they you know have a major crime or once they're sentenced. So we're not getting those minor infraction arrests coming right in. We're just getting them after a period of time going to court and getting sentenced to a term. So we are getting them eventually, just not right away. We have time for like one last question. This is just a really powerful conversation. Um, I want to just, I'm gonna throw two questions out there, the last final two. Uh, how has the ongoing pandem pandemic impacted the efforts and what steps have been taken to address any impacts? And then also, where can we go as community organizers and advocates to get more funding and staff to intensify the efforts that you guys are making to get these traffickers off the streets? Well, as a single mom with a five-year-old in this pandemic and having the history that I have, um, definitely being impacted as far as my past goes. I went to school for something that I could be working right now during this pandemic. I could be able to be providing for my child during this pandemic, but because of my past, I can't. Um, it's bad. It's terrible. It's really, really hard. And I'm pretty sure for a lot of other people, it's pretty hard. Yeah. As far as fundraising goes, you guys just let me know when you want to do that. I'll be part of it. Molly, can you can you um, repeat the second question? I think? Yes. So can community organizations and leaders and advocates, uh, what can be done to get more funding and more staff to intensify the efforts to get these traffickers off the street? Um, I, you know, um, I'm going to answer that. And so there's a really important uh, important role and that that ECLI and a lot of organizations working with survivors are doing and that is when you empower the survivor you're also assisting in the prosecution and I need people to realize that because if if the per if your uh, you know witness to a case disappears um, you don't have a case and so we need to understand that you know one of the crucial aspects of organizations like my own is that um, we're supporting the survivor. We're assisting them with housing, you know, and housing is a huge crisis on Long Island. There is no housing and there's no adequate housing. So imagine, you know, uh, putting a survivor who has already gone through an ordeal in now in one of the shelters uh, that we have in Suffolk County, you know, their success rate just being placed in one of those shelters goes down dramatically because of where they're at. You know, it's, I think it's almost even like abusive sometimes to even put them in some of these places. We need to be looking at adequate housing, adequate resources, um, you know, being able to have individuals within the Department of Social Services individuals in the social security office, individuals that can help us bypass a lot of the bureaucracy that exists for us to be able to assist and also support our survivors in getting the things that they need, 
that they're eligible for. You know, uh, we have a great working relationship with the court system. Lois is one of our greatest, fiercest advocates that we have in that aspect. You know, they are, but we are still lacking in many other areas. We need the awareness. We need people to care. We need people to start talking about it, but also individually. I know many of the individuals uh, that are listening here today have organizations or have some form of connection with organizations or, um, or governmental agencies. We need those connections to be able to help bridge the connections so that our survivors are getting what they need, especially in that dire moment where they're leaving their trafficker. And that is so important for us. So if you're interested, that is my call for help. <laughs> We need more help to provide these services, to bridge what our, our survivors uh, are in need of um, without hitting, you know, those brick walls, without not, you know, without getting the, the runaround. We need real help to support them because yeah. if you're supporting the survivor, then you're supporting law enforcement and everything that they're trying to do. Yeah, thank you, Betty. Um, I just want to mention it's now 9.01, so we're just going to wrap up right now. We just put a slew of handouts in the chat, which have tons of information on where you can go to help advocate for victims and survivors of human trafficking, to donate, to get involved, to help raise awareness here in Suffolk County. This conversation does not end tonight. This is ongoing, and we'll be having more and more um, opportunities for us to learn from each other and to discuss all of the hard work that we're doing together. I want to first and foremost thank Tatiana for sharing your story and for showing up tonight and being here for us and just, you know, expressing yourself so beautifully and so powerfully. Um, I don't know if you've been able to see the chat because I think you're on your phone, but I'm not I can sure. I actually see it. I'm seeing okay. all of the pop There's so tons cool. of like awesome. love coming your way. <laughs> Okay. Um, I love anything I love to help you guys. I love it. You guys are amazing. And I think what you're all doing is absolutely beautiful. And they need, like, we just need to, like, create a thousand more of you guys and everything will be okay, you know? There you go. But That's this is a start. Mean. It's not the end. Just like you said, it's just the beginning. Exactly. And the, I want everybody, hopefully, to remember, you know, um, just to ask, are you okay? I think that was really powerful and simple. And it's a great takeaway for everybody. Um, I want to thank all of our panelists tonight for making this event so successful. Thank you to our host, Empowerment Collaborative of Long Island, and Toro Law Center's Criminal Law Society, Women's Bar Association, and Family Law Society. And a special thanks to Georgia Reed, ECLI's legal extern from Toro Law Center. Thank you to Lois Roman and Jennifer Hernandez for helping plan this event, and Zonta Club of Suffolk County for our Zoom capabilities tonight, which was somewhat seamless. Thank you everyone for joining <laughs> us. Please check the handouts. We're gonna be following up with an evaluation that we would love your feedback. I promise you it's short and sweet. Just let us know how we did, what we can improve on. And um, yeah, I think that's everything. Thanks everybody. I love all of you and especially Sarge Murphy and Betty. You guys are the bomb diggity. <laughs> Thanks everybody. Bye. Thank you, good night. Thank you. Good night. Good night. Be safe. Be COVID free. Bye, Good today. <laughs> Bye. Love you guys. Bye. Love Tatiana. Bye. Bye. I'm going to end the meeting. There's still 30 participants. So good night, everyone. Good night, Lois. Thank you. Good night, Lois. Thank you. Good night, Sergeant Murphy. Good night. Good night.